So it's a great pleasure after a week interregnum to introduce uh, Oscar Schofeld, who um, uh, received his PhD and his undergraduate degree and his postdoc from the uh, University of California at Santa Barbara, UCSB, and uh, Californian at heart, but has been here in Jersey for many years. And we're quite excited to hear Oscar is also the chair of the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences, and it's been so since 2012, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's been way uh, too long. Yeah, I understand. Um, this let me check a couple, one, one or two mind things, getting rid of the entry and exit tone, mute on entry, so everybody's muted. So we're, we're good to go, Oscar. We're recording and live, so you take over. Thanks. Apologize for last week. Um, just some family adventures. But uh, what I'm going to do today is talk to you about um, a program I've been involved with off and on since graduate school. Um, and it's one of these long term ecological research projects from NSF. And we're looking at um, the changes happening along the West Antarctic Peninsula. And so my sort of take home messages here um, are already listed, you know, we're looking at climate cycles and how they're changing the WAP and how changes in the sea ice ripples through the entire food web. Um, and so that's the story I'm going to tell. Like all time series, um, it's really a family effort. And so um, we have a LTR team with rotating faculty. I've been in it. I got pulled back in about 12 years ago. Um, the Are You Cool team, which provides a lot of the technology stuff. And of course, the graduate students and postdocs and undergraduates too, that are the anchor for field efforts um, and thank the National Science Foundation. So where do we work? Um, we work in that orange circle there, just south of South America. We uh, leave every year, cross the Drake and survey this region of Antarctica. Uh, we're about to have our 31st year uh, field season coming up. Uh, time series are one of the priorities for NSF. So we were allowed to go when a lot of the field programs are being postponed a year because of COVID. And this area is rapidly melting. The red colors here show you where glaciers and sea ice are in mammoth retreat. The slight blues show where they're growing. And this is one of the fastest melting places on the planet. Here's our study grid. And the way the program works is we really have two uh, efforts. At Palmer Station, which is here on Anvers Island, um, there's a field station there. And we essentially have a team that's present there six months of the year. And so our research scientist is deploying in about three weeks to go down. Um, and so we essentially study the seasonal dynamics from Palmer Station, um, and it's also the location of a major penguin colony. And then every January, uh, we have a long, uh, about an eight week cruise, and we sample um, sort of fixed grid stations. Those are the red dots. We also put in moorings. Those are the green stars. And the lines represent uh, autonomous glider flights um, surveying where the ship can't be. And so uh, what we have in the WAP is really a climate gradient. So up in the north, the system is transition. I'll show you some of the data um, to be a warmer, wet, more maritime climate. It's less of an Antarctic system. And then Palmer is right at the border uh, between the transition zone. And then we still have a cooler, drier polar system to the south. Um, and so we get a snapshot every January of the spatial picture. And then we've got the time series within the seasons at Palmer Station. So this area is changing very quickly. Uh, the upper left shows you winter air temperature trends uh, since the 1950s. And what we've seen is the winters are warming dramatically. Uh, and it's one of the fastest winter warming places on the planet. Uh, and the other thing to notice is 
in more recent years, the variance in that winter temperatures is decreasing. And this is sort of a nice signal uh, that we've transitioned to a maritime climate at these field stations. Below that shows you the sea ice trends. Uh, there's a lot of variability in it. The three different colors just indicate three different locations along the WAP, and it's pretty coherent across the entire WAP. So the blue line on top is the one far south, and so there's still a fair amount of sea ice. Um, uh, the red line is a Palmer station. Generally, um, what we've seen is annually sea ice has declined by almost three months. 90 days. Um, and what we're going to talk about is how the sea ice has uh, structures, structures the food web there. So it has big biological consequences. And just sort of as a visceral way to look at it, uh, on the right is pictures of the retreating Mar Glacier right behind Palmer Station. Um, and what you see is the glacier is retreated uh, significantly. So this whole area here, Palmer Station's in that red circle. Um, and so actually what is kind of wild in my mind is as the glacier is retreated, um, we're discovering new islands. And so uh, we're actually able to name the islands as we discover them. So uh, the, this area has seen dramatic change in my professional lifetime. My first trip down there was in 1988 and the glacier was great for skiing, and now it's just an icy mess. What's the driver of the change? It's really dominated by the southern annular mode. It's the sort of the dominant mode that impacts the atmospheric variability over Antarctica. And what we see is if we're in a positive SAM, that's the southern annular mode, or a La Nina, we get strong winds from the South Pacific blowing up against the uh, continent. And those northerly winds result in less sea ice. And we've been sort of locked in to a positive SAM mode uh, for, for well over a decade or two. Um, and so these climate cycles influence the prevailing winds. But it's not that those winds carry heat into the continent. The primary source of heat is actually the Antarctic circumpolar current. So it's the one current unimpeded by a continent. It's uh, about 300 meters depth, and it's the largest current on the planet, and it's balmy. It's four degrees Celsius. Um, and so when we get these positive Sam La Nina wind patterns, you essentially upwell um, this circumpolar current onto the peninsula, as well as uh, Pine Island Glacier and into the Amundsen Sea, where there's a lot of those reports of runaway ice sheet collapse. Um, so it's really the deep ocean that's the primary heat source. And you can sort of do the back of the envelope calculation and calculate how much the atmosphere is heated. And what you find is this current is the only uh, source with enough heat to drive the heating and melting we've been seeing. So um, the deep ocean is a driver here. And what happens is, is the circumpolar current swings around, let's go back here, swings along the peninsula. And one reason that we see so much melting along this continent, um, this part of the continent, is because this is where the circumpolar current impinges closest to land. Um, the other places we're seeing uh, melting and heating is in the Taunton area, which is over in this area here. Um, and the current runs along the continental shelf and continental slope, There's some irregular tree there. And the current breaks off into small eddies that are transported um, across the continental shelf and essentially release heat as they do that. Um, and it also drives the penguin ecology, and I'll talk about that. These eddies are very, very hard to find. They're about 30 kilometers um, in size. Um, they're episodic. Um, they have a lifetime, about eight days. They come a few times a week. And they primarily get transported towards the land in glacially carved submarine canyons. And um, we never had a good estimate 
um, of those dynamics, but the gliders actually have allowed us to study it. Um, so what you're seeing here in this, and this is just a cool technology uh, story, is here's an eddy, um, and we've been able to find it at 300 meters depth with a glider based on its temperature signature. And we've essentially surfed the eddy for seven days uh, subsurface to look at its changing nature as it's transported across the shelf. And um, you can see where the eddies are here in the Northern Canyon and a lot here in Marguerite Trough. And as the eddies get transported from the slope to the coast, um, they lose heat, they become smaller and more amorphous. And it's the heat that these eddies release that essentially warm the surface and off gas to the atmosphere. Um, so now we've got a good idea of the dynamics of these eddies. Um, and we know that they're the primary source of heat um, driving it, especially in wintertime. And these canyons happen to coincide with penguin colonies. And there was always a question why. The primary idea was that in wintertime, Adelie penguins, which are a true polar penguin species, needed access to water. These eddies provided a conduit of this warm water that would upwell as it hit the coast and create regions of recurrent pollinias. Um, there had been not much evidence. Um, it was a sort of an idea until we had some of the tools to maintain a sustained presence um, and simulate it. So um, one way we've been studying these processes is using numerical models. We use the Regional Ocean Modeling System, working with Jeff Dinneman and Jessica Graham. And we assimilate, we essentially simulate the transport of these uh, offshore circumpolar deep water. And so what you're seeing here is hypothetical Lagrangian particles that we embed within the model, and then we push it forward. And we can put in as many of these hypothetical particles and see where they end. The other thing we can do is we can embed particles near the coast in these canyons and ask, uh, where do they go? Take home message is um, here we have the continental slope in our model grid. Here's Palmer Deep at Anvers Island that we're very interested in. And about 20 to 30% of the particles out in the slopes, especially in close proximity, do reach these canyons where the penguins are. Um, and a lot of it retains the nature of the circumpolar deep water, which is water temperatures above uh, 1.8 degrees. So you'll sometimes find two degree deep water in that system, um, reflecting offshore water that had been uh, migrated across the coastline. And so we have a source of hot water reaching these canyons that were from the circumpolar deep water. And we believe that the upwelling of this warm water would have in the past when there was a lot of sea ice um, had water access to the penguins. So do we see that? Um, I'm gonna show you a snapshot. This is Palmer Station at the penguin colony. This is again, uh, using the gliders to do it. You can see the warm water at depth and you can see it upwell as it nears the coast. And so that, Hypothesis seems to be holding. If you go down to uh, Adelaide Island by Marguerite Trough, um, the island is very big. You have penguin colonies only on certain locations, and it's associated with these locations where we see this warm water being uh, upwelled and mixed to the surface. On the other side of Adelaide, where it remains highly stratified um, and there is no circumpolar deep water, you don't find penguin colonies. So the deep ocean and these glacially carved caverns essentially set up where you're gonna find penguins along the peninsula. So we've been now sort of studying how the, it's connected to the annual inner variability of the ice. And what we find is in a negative SAM year, it'll be a high winter sea ice year. Um, that will melt back in the summer um, and what it does do when you put this high ice on the system on the ocean is it protects it from the winter wind. And while you have a mixed layer depth, it'll still get pretty deep. The water, water is pretty stable. And when you melt the ice back, it stratifies uh, pretty quickly 
leads to big diatom blooms that then are immediately consumed by krill. In a positive sand mice, you have much lower sea ice present on the system. It gets exposed to that heavy winter wind. Um, and when we're talking heavy wind, uh, some winters down there, the average wind speed can be 40 knots for the entire season. So it's very effective at mixing that surface ocean. With less ice uh, melting on top of the ocean, heavy winds and a very deep mixed layer, what we tend to find are smaller phytoplankton blooms uh, with smaller critters moving in, cryptophytes and flagellates. Uh, and that translates to less food for the krill and so on up the food chain. So let's take a look at some of the time series. Do we see any relationship between the mixed layer depth um, that sort of sets up whether you're gonna have a bloom or not and sea ice? Uh, red here is the upper mixed layer depth. Uh, for the WAP, and you can see a relatively nice inverse relationship in years where you have a lot of sea ice, the mixed layer depth is very shallow um, and vice versa. And the big changes we see aren't so much exhibited um, in the coastline. And that's simply because a lot of ice is invected from the far south and piles up along the coastal zones. Um, it's not growing sea ice like it used to be. Um, but the mixed layer depths out on the continental shelf and the continental slope have shown a dramatic shallowing as we've been moving into this warming phase. And you, if you look at that surface layer of these mixed layer depths, um, it's becoming fresher. So as the mixed layer depth shallows, the salinity decreases, and so we have a nice signature that the sea ice, as it melts, helps stratify that water. And if you go to sort of cut our grid in half, so in the north where it's already, whoops, transitioned, um, you can see there's interannual variability in sort of the seasonal mixed layer depth, but it hasn't really changed dramatically. Down the southern part of our grid, which is now actively melting, the mixed layer depth has shallowed um, almost by a factor of two uh, in the last you know, 20 years. Some years when conditions are ripe, you'll see really anomalous low sea ice years. There was a slight recovery um, in the last decade. It's now returned back to where it was before in terms of sea ice. But essentially, as that sea ice is melting, mixed layer depths are shallowing, and you would predict that that would lead to higher productivity. Um, so this is a satellite map, and what we've done here is we've compared uh, what the ocean color phytoplankton maps looked like in the uh, 80s versus the late 90s. Blue indicates where that it suggested that the phytoplankton concentrations have decreased. So up in the north, where we've transitioned into a subpolar maritime system, the phytoplankton productivity has declined quite dramatically. And that's where we see declines in other parts of the food web. Down the south, um, we see that the productivity has increased. Why is that? Well, uh, this used to be covered by ice, and as you've melted the ice, you've shallowed the mixed layer depth, and you promote higher phytoplankton blooms. Our prediction is, is that as you continue to melt over time, this climate gradient is going to move south, and this will transition to blue um, in 20, 30 years if things continue as we expect. Um, so we can actually see, at least over um, decadal time scales, shifts in the amount of productivity um, in the ocean. And it's this mixed layer depth that really drives uh, how much phytoplankton you grow, as well as um, how much CO2 you draw into the ocean. So as the mixed layer depth shallows, you draw in more CO2 in the ocean. The size of the circles indicates the size of the blooms. This is based on discrete measurements of phytoplankton pigments. Um, and the color indicates the type. So big blooms in the West Antarctic are really dominated by diatoms. The next most important bloomer are these cryptophyte flagellates. Um, they can form large blooms, but they tend to dominate smaller ones. And then mixed flagellates are usually a background population. 
So down in the south, where we've been shifting to shallower mixed layer depths, we're getting larger diatom blooms and we're sucking in more CO2. And you can see that in this side panel. This was a nice paper by Mike Brown, a former graduate student. And you can see the changing mixed layer depth as it shallows across the West Antarctic Peninsula. Associated with that is the increase in the amount of phytoplankton in the water and the increased drawdown of carbon into the ocean. And so uh, the down south, again, dominated by large diatoms, some dinoflagellates, and then you have the flagellates dominating here in the north. And uh, one thing just to mention is in terms of the drawdown of CO2 in the ocean, it makes a difference who's blooming. And so these small flagellated guys are less efficient at drawing in CO2 if you normalize it per unit biomass than the diatoms are. So as we transition to a more maritime system, you not only change the amount that's blooming, um, but you change the type of phytoplankton that's blooming. So let's take a look at sort of this resilience experiment where we had this decadal increase in sea ice recently. Um, and what we've done is we've looked at three different time series. There's up here in the northern Bransfield Strait. The Argentinians have been collecting a time series. Here's our time series at Palmer Station. And here's the English time series at Rothra Base. Uh, Rothra Base is in the far south, at least in terms of conditions. So it's uniquely different in terms of the amount of sea ice formed and to the north. And as we move into this increasing sea ice phase, we see more phytoplankton blooms in the north. Um, and that's because you're essentially now providing that protection in the wintertime from the heavy winds. Uh, so we do actually see that when the ice recovered, the base of the food web showed recovery. Does that translate up the food web? Um, yes, it does. So this is a great paper by Grace Saba. Um, you're looking here at the top of chlorophyll anomalies. So if you're above zero, that's a big phytoplankton bloom year. And then um, if you're negative, that's a small phytoplankton bloom year. Uh, the black is chlorophyll, so it's phytoplankton. The stripe line is bacterial production. So you see that phytoplankton go up and down and it mirrors what you see in the bacteria. Down below is um, penguin diets. So uh, Bill Frazier, um, since the 70s, has been tracking the penguin populations. Uh, and then in the 80s, he started looking at diet samples. And what you do is you catch a penguin, you put a little seawater down its throat, and it pukes up what it um, ate. You then gather up all the puke, and you sort it. And you can actually sort the size of the Antarctic krill it's eating. So if you're up here, um, the overall diet samples show that there are large krill. If it's down here, the population of krill is dominated more by juvenile krill. And uh, what you see is when you have a chlor positive chlorophyll anomaly, you transition from a large population of uh, adult krill to larval krill. So what's happening during these uh, Anomaly years, uh, there's a lot of food for the krill, little mood music turns on, and you have a huge recruitment event, and you shift the demographics of the population to larval. Then over time, you can see the population grow, another chlorophyll anomaly, large recruitment year, reset, and you can see it recurring. Uh, when we started doing this analysis, it was as we were transitioning into these increasing sea ice years over the last decade. And again, that sea ice increase has disappeared. Last year, there was um, a poor sea ice year. Um, and what you see is there's a direct translation of the physics and the circulation of the deep ocean, driving phytoplankton productivity and translating right up to penguin diets and krill. The other thing to notice, just as I was sort of mentioning before, if you're looking at this chlorophyll anomaly and you're looking who is growing, uh, again, in a big chlorophyll year, diatoms dominate. Um, they're really the big driver here. And as you move to slower years, it's these flagellates that uh, become important. And so does that have any 
ecological importance? Well, it kind of does. So the diatoms we find our location are relatively large, 50 microns and up often. Um, there are small diatoms, but we see lots of large ones. Uh, the flagellates, on the other hand, the cryptophytes are quite small, uh, really smaller than 10 microns, more around seven microns in size. And that has a big impact on the krill. Krill feed with um, these arms that are feathered and they sort of scoop the water and they shove all the food in their mouth. And it's a perfect strategy if you're harvesting these giant redwood diatoms. Um, very efficient at clearing big cells into their mouth. Um, the problem with small guys is they're small enough that they pass through these feathered appendages. Um, and so you see that if you move to a small flagellate population dominating, it directly translates into how much of that biomass is going to be consumed by the krill. Um, so what we find is uh, that not only when you move to these populations is there less chlorophyll present, it's grazed less efficiently by the krill. And so there's sort of a bottom-up effect um, that translates directly into the krill success. The other thing, just to remind you, is when you transition to these small guys, is also when you see less CO2 being drawn into the ocean. So if we look at krill, and there's many different types of krill, the one you read about most of the time is Euphausia superba. Um, it's a few centimeters long, very good at grazing. You can see the green it's got there. Um, there's other types of krill, um, like E. chrysolophorius. Um, this is a particular species that needs lots of sea ice. Um, and you can see that you have different responses between the two. For the krill, what we see are these cyclical patterns of recruitment. And this is out in the outer shelf. What I was showing you before was right by Palmer Station. Um, and what we're seeing is, is it's related to that phasing of the La Nina to the uh, positive southern annular mode. Um, and it's not a real significant correlation um, between the physics and the krill recruitment, but you do find a very tight, significant correlation to the phytoplankton. So hopefully a few more years of data will essentially allow us to uh, strengthen the relationship of how the physics is translating up to the secondary producers. So how about the higher Producers. Well, this is what sort of started the time series. Bill Frazier, um, you know, started doing his thesis in the 70s, and he was tracking the Adelie penguins. So this is, again, one of the two true polar Antarctic penguins. Uh, the other one is the emperor penguin, happy feet. They're further to the south. Um, they're not really found in our grid. And at Palmer Station, we had about 15,000 breeding pairs. Whoops. when Bill Frazier started. And we're actually down, um, if you update this, uh, we're down to about 1,800 breeding pairs of Adelie penguins. So there's been a precipitous decline in this species. And this was the species that would have evolved to essentially take advantage of the pollinia uh, to overwinter in the Antarctic. Doesn't mean that life disappears completely. Um, we're seeing now this invasion of Gen 2 and Chinstrap penguins. And these are subpolar penguin species, much more suited for northern conditions. Um, they don't do well in sea, heavy sea ice here. Um, and you can see that it, you're transitioning from sea ice obligate species like the Adelity to sort of ice avoiding species. Um, the Gen 2 and the chin straps. And so one thing driving this decline is the changing uh, food resources, um, you know, given that they got to feed their chicks. And so the penguins come back to the same colony year after year. They have their breeding season. And when they lay their chicks, they've essentially got three months and they have to get about four kilograms of fat on the chick if it's going to survive that first year. Um, and it's a pretty um, dramatic 
cut off. Um, and so what we've been trying to now do is link sort of the food resources and the other stresses the populations are feeling to explain that declining uh, trend in the Adelie populations. So there has been a change in um, the krill resource. Um, but the other thing that's happening is, is we move to a maritime climate. Um, the atmosphere has become moister. It's become darker in the ocean, which affects, again, the phytoplankton in terms of photosynthesis, but it brings rain. And so we're seeing dramatic amounts of uh, increased rain. And for a chick, you can see this poor guy in the bottom left here, uh, wet and shivering. It puts a heavy thermal regulatory cost on that chick. And that comes at the expense of putting on fat. And you can sort of compare the two chicks there, a healthy one versus one that's not going to survive. Um, and we think that this thermal regulatory cost is actually one of the big drivers. You know, it could be offset with uh, ample food with krill, um, but we see that that's transitioning. Um, and so what we find is during ice years, um, the chicks are fatter or the heavier ice years. Um, and during low sea ice years, uh, the chick survival is significantly lower. Um, so there is the sea ice effect that we think ripples through up through the food resources. You combine that with increased rain in warmer years. And we think that underlies the decline of the Delhi populations to the north. Associated with these rain events, it turns out there's very much increased storm activity in the years where you have low sea ice um, and increased rain. And part of where we're transitioning our program is to start looking at these landscape effects and sort of parse out what's the impact of what's happening in the ocean on the population versus what's happening on the land. We put radio tags on the penguins and the gentoos and the whales you'll see in a minute. Um, and we're sort of now comparing uh, their foraging areas. So the Adelis are there in blue. Um, you can look at sort of the average foraging. We have about 15 years of data now. You compare that to the Gentoo. So the Gentoo has a very large foraging region relative to the Adelis. The Adelis don't um, like to move around much. They like to stay close to the rookery. The Gentoos are really good in open water. Um, and what we find is in a heavy ice year versus a low ice year, in a heavy ice year, we have a very constricted uh, foraging zone. Um, the Gentoos, on the other hand, don't know how to deal with sea ice. They look incredibly awkward. They essentially run along the top of the sea ice, but I'm using quotes here, run. Um, and the other thing about sea ice, it's very irregular. It's not like a flat sea ice. And so they expend a huge amount of e energy in heavy sea ice years, um, just trying to get into water and find the krill. While the Adelis are very much attuned in operating in sea ice and maintain a compact foraging area, which translates into less energy burned looking for food. The final factor that we're starting to take a look at is changes in other prey items. Um, there used to be a huge uh, incidence of uh, fish. And if you look over time, the proportion of fish in the diets has been changing. You don't really see it in this figure up there simply because that's when the sea ice recovered. Um, but if you go back in time in the 70s, 50% of the diet used to be fish for the penguins. And a fish, um, these are about five to seven inches. So one fish equals about 200 krill in terms of energy. And so um, as the sea ice has retreated dramatically in the north, the uh, fish species that um, are dependent on sea ice for their larvae have disappeared and you've moved to a 100% sort of krill diet for the most part. Um, so there's these three different factors that are driving that decline in sea ice. One thing 
we had hypothesized was that there might be increased competition from whales. So um, along the West Antarctic Peninsula, that's where the whaling industry was very large. And about 100 years ago, we had almost wiped, humanity had almost wiped out the whales along the entire peninsula. And it, you go to islands um, along the peninsula and you'll find them uh, covered in whale bones, especially to the north. Uh, they were protected and they have bounced back in a dramatic way. And it's led to this hypothesis that um, you took the whales out of the system, the penguin populations expanded because they weren't competing for food. And now as the whales have returned, um, there might be enhanced competition for the food. Um, so we've been working on that. We tend to do that um, looking at the home ranges of the whale. We put tags on the whales so we know where they are. We also know the nature of their swimming. Um, just like the Adelie penguins and uh, the Gentoo penguins, there's two types of main whales we look at. Humpback whales, these tend to be whale species that aren't a big fan of ice. The minke whales are very close to sea ice. And we've seen um, that the humpback whales, as the ice has melted, have now expanded their range further to the south and their population is growing dramatically. Minke whales, um, it's less clear simply because they're really hard to sample. They're very nervous whales. And so you're very lucky if you get a tag on them and they will actually avoid the ships as much as possible and are very fast. Humpback whales, on the other hand, are really lazy. Um, they will actually come right up to the boat um, and aren't scared of zodiacs or anything. So we have pretty good sense of state on that. So we've been looking at sort of the overlap of the foraging between the penguins, the two different species, the Gentoos and the Adelis, and now the humpback whales. Uh, generally, the humpback whales are feeding in a very similar location and actually at a pretty similar depth. So the main foraging of the whales, humpback at least in this particular season was around 25 meters depth. Adelis was just above 20 meters. So if there was a, a competition, you would expect that the birds might feel it. Um, but what we've actually noticed is um, we've been looking at whale pregnancy rates. You do that by measuring progesterone. Um, this is the group out of Duke University and UC Santa Cruz that's anchoring this work. Um, and you can get a measurement of this uh, enzyme by taking a blubber sample. Um, the way you do a blubber sample uh, extraction from a whale is with a crossbow. Um, you don't have an arrow tip um, on the arrow. It's a little tube and you shoot the crossbow. It hits the side of the whale, bounces back, um, taking a little blubber sample in that little tube and then you have to drive up and grab it. So these are hand collected blubber samples from large critters by Zodiac. Um, and they've got a good test that's been developed for pregnancy. And the take home message is, is we're seeing pregnancy rates that are extreme, extremely high. Um, we're finding that we're seeing female whales pregnant every single year with a new calf. Um, this is metabol me metabolically um, incredibly expensive. And if there was a real constriction for food, we wouldn't expect to see such high pregnancy rates. And so we're, um, our standing hypothesis now is there's remains enough krill to maintain the populations and the dynamics in terms of declines in certain populations has more to do with these other factors um, including thermal regulatory costs, storms, snow, et cetera. Um, yeah, so uh, high pregnancy rates, pregnant multiple years in a row, and the population has recovered dramatically. So um, one thing that is changing for us is the phenology of um, the whole system. So the seasonality of it based on the retreat in advance of sea ice. And 
what we're finding what's harder for us is to sample that and so we're transitioning also our program into more automated approaches so this is autonomous glider data um, and the purple locations here are those time series the argentinians and germans and the koreans us brits and you're looking at cross sections here um, of temperature and particles in the water uh, and we think we've demonstrated that we can now start thinking about setting up an autonomous network for the entire grid and fill in the months we're not there. Um, we have one cruise a year in January, so we're getting only one snapshot realization, um, and we hope to improve that. Um, we need better estimates of the krill. Uh, net toes are great, but we miss a lot of dynamics, and so Grace Saba um, has worked and has now integrated multi-frequency acoustics in, so we can take maps now of fish and zooplankton remotely and cover that grid I showed you before. So that's something we're transitioning heavily into, and you might have seen some data from Josh last week on that. And then we're moving to drones. And so there's been a lot of recent reports of using satellites to find penguin colonies. The way that works is the penguins poop a lot. You can see the red sort of halos here in this R RGB image. Um, and what that is is krill poop. And it's red because of all the krill it's eating. Um, so we're also moving into using drones to co collect high resolution maps in areas we necessarily can't sample. Um, and the resolution on these drone maps is about three centimeters. So we can actually make out chicks versus adults um, we can potentially make out even different types of penguin species. Uh, the other thing it allows us to do is look at ecology. You don't want to sample from a zodiac. These are two humpback whales feeding. You can see the bubble net where they aggregate all the krill in the middle. Um, if you're in a zodiac and you start seeing little bubbles around your boat, that's pretty much a message. You should get out of there right away um, because that means there's a humpback probably coming up beneath you um very soon so uh the hope for us and this is out of necessity too is that we're going to automate sampling the u.s antarctic program has been fiscally constrained and the u.s um is going to lose one of its two antarctic ships i think in the next year or two so even though um korea asia china Japan, the Europeans are all expanding their seagoing fleet. The US will find its fleet cut in half. And so we have a window of time to work out automated techniques as much as possible to um, sort of follow that. And then this is another tool we're using to sort of get an idea of whale grazing. We have a suction cupped camera here on the whale. You're going to see it open its mouth um in just a second um here comes there's the mouth opening it's filled with water you'll see all these krill passing by and so the other thing from a modeling perspective we need is to get a better idea of the fundamental rate processes um we can do phytoplankton well paul falkowski was with us on a cruise a few years ago and his fluorometric approaches will be key but to get to grazing for krill and the higher trophic levels, we'll be moving to sort of some of these camera approaches. So in conclusion, climate cycles are modulating the presence of sea ice, and that's by modulating the position of that circumpolar current in the offshore waters. The amount of sea ice um, in the winter and spring has a big impact on the mixed layer depth, and that directly affects the phytoplankton that directly translates up to krill recruitment. Um, and then ends up in the diet of the apex predators. We have evidence, though, that there still seem to be sufficient krill to maintain the food web, um, and that there are other factors that are driving declines in the polar species. And we're going to be continuing to pursue with the cool group um, as many of these new techniques to fill in our sampling, um, as it's likely we won't be able to be there as often as we were in the past. So. Thanks so much, Ken, for organizing all these talks. And um, I'm open for questions if anyone has any. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Oscar. Uh, 
maybe just a quick comment from all these years that you've been going down there as to just how dramatic the changes are. So the dramatic change, um, what I have seen is in the northern regions, um, what used to have sea ice in October, November now is just open water. If you go to the Argentinian base, it used to have you know, annual sea ice growth and retreat. It's open water all the time. And the glacial melt is so dramatic. What used to be a clear blue bay is now dark brown by the amount of sediment being washed directly off um, the islands. And the sediment wash off is large enough where if it's a very vigorous flooding event, the krill choke on small pebbles and sand. Um, and so uh, the glacier behind Palmer Station used to be right where the satellite dish is. And now I have to walk two football fields about to reach the base of the glacier. And that's just in my professional career. Okay. You know, um, the uh, krill um, story is still open, but if you talk to Bill Frazier, he is sent, essentially started in the 70s and many of the islands he used to go to to do penguin censuses had thousands of penguins and sort of the sad story is is he associated those islands with lots of noise with all these talking penguins and now it's silent there are no penguins on those islands there's wind um and so from a science side it's an amazing opportunity to be able to follow entire ecosystem transitions in your lifetime but your human part is actually really sad as you're seeing a whole different system move in. So I have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, it's hard to know whether it goes on or not. In some of the seabirds that I work with, there's a big difference in parental care as a function of rain. So for example, in Barnegat Bay, um, if there's a really bad rainstorm and the chicks are a certain age, the skimmers don't do anything about their chicks. They just get yeah. and they die. Whereas common terns brood them really extensively. And I'm wondering whether there's a difference in the penguins um, in their ability to, whether they've ever uh, ex experienced this and so they're not doing it. Because the skimmer chicks, some years, all of them, all of them die from a really bad three day storm. Yeah. And none so of the terns do. Yeah, with the penguins, they're very um, uh, enthusiastic parents. Um, the parents pair up and they will alternate the male and female going out and collecting food and bringing back to their chicks. Um, and so what we do see are mammoth um, recruitment failures. Those tend to be years when there's a lot of snow and the atmosphere is moist. And the Adelie penguins, when they build their nests, tend to build it in sort of outcrops that are protected from wind. Um, but they tend to be gullies. So if you get a lot of snow and a lot of snow melt, the eggs drown. Um, the other penguins um, don't seem to worry much. They tend to put some of their nests sort of in more open exposed areas. They weren't evolved to sort of protect themselves from the heavy Antarctic winds as dramatically. Um, so if it's a very icy, heavy wind storm year, they get hammered from that, um, but their eggs are up generally higher. So there is some really important life history components that drive these dynamics. Um, and that's a big focus area for us now. There's a question from uh, John. Can you recap the pregnancy rates? Yeah. So. Um, we've got now about six, seven years of whale pregnancy data um, from these blubber samples. And what we see is pregnancy rates that are extremely high, where a female humpback is pregnant with a new calf every year. And sometimes you'll see the mother pregnant still taking care of the calf from the year before. So the metabolic costs and the thinking from Ari Freelander is that if there was any constriction on food resources, um, it would be hard to maintain that high of a pregnancy rate. And the other thing we're seeing is, is as the ice is now 
not um, coming in as early in the fall as it did in the past, the amount of time the humpbacks are spending along the peninsula is increasing. Um, so we think that if there was a super heavy competition for food and food was limiting, that we wouldn't see such high pregnancy rates um, in the whales. Yeah, so about half the female are pregnant every single year. Um, if you go to other locations, that number is significantly lower. When you say us, well, I didn't see what. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm say us, how many groups and how many people are involved or associated with your work? With yeah, the so um, the LTRs are set up with um, multiple universities, and then you you'd carry the cross for your component um, for a while, and then you rotate new people in. Um, the uh, Our groups right now, and we're just going through a transition, um, Rutgers, uh, William and Mary, the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences, UC Santa Cruz, uh, Woods Hole, Ben Van Moy, is part of our team, University of Delaware, Carlos Moffat, who's a physical oceanographer for University of Colorado. So the LTRs tend to be um, very large collections of universities. We've got about eight. We have a lot of international collaboration associated with that, um, with the Koreans, Argentinians, Germans, and the English. Um, so that expands out our sampling range sort of in partnership. Uh, but we're still small, a small LTR compared to other terrestrial sites where there's really no logistical issues. We're limited in terms of people by the number of births we have on the ship and the number of births we have at the station. So a normal year, we will have about, you know, 30 to 40 people in the field every year across the universities. This year's gonna be a challenge for us um, the biggest priority is not to let COVID reach the continent. Um, so we have been prioritized to deploy, but we cannot have people share rooms like you do on a ship normally. So our ship team is usually about 25. We'll be allowed 10. I, our Palmer group is usually around 10 and we'll be allowed to have four this year. So, um, uh, we still have a mandate to maintain all the core measurements. So it means that it's just not going to be a lot of sleep this coming year. Well, Bob Chan asked if there's any changes in long-term wind speed and direction. Yes. So um, that's a great question, um, especially in the north. Wind speeds have increased um, significantly. Um, and we see that the direction is slowly shifting um, more dramatically coming out of sort of this you know south pacific which is affiliated with warmer air than if it's coming sort of from the south um, and we think i showed you that satellite map of the blue where the phytoplankton have declined we think that's because um, it's gotten windier uh, the mixed layer depths are more variable and on top of it is you make the atmosphere moist, you get more clouds. And if you're a phytoplankton in the Southern Ocean, the Southern Ocean is a dark ocean. Even with 24 hours of sunlight, it's still a much lower photon flux if you integrate um, than you find in the tropics. And so we think that uh, the winds are essentially one of the factors driving those declines we see way in the Northern part of the Antarctic Peninsula. Other questions? Well, for no more, I wanted to thank you, Oscar. Thank you. Excellent presentation. And uh, sorry okay. about last week and my um, ill-considered dogs. So, <laughs> yeah, the uh, the story there is our neighbors have free-range chickens, and if uh, the dogs get out, um, they get a snack, and I get. Uh, a little bit of attitude from the neighbor. So uh, about 20 minutes before the talk was supposed to start last week, I heard the dogs in the neighbor's yard and 
was trying to save some chickens. So. Well, this, I'm glad you were able to give this talk. This has been a really fun series for the summer and especially gives us a feeling for going back in the field. The good news is that a lot of us are seeing the ability to go back in the field. And you told me at the beginning that you will be going back, albeit with a three week warrant. Yeah. Before you get on the ship, that we is fly. Awesome. We fly to Chile. They drive us directly to the ship, and we stay tied to the docks, quarantined on the ship for three weeks before we're allowed to leave for the continent. So, Christmas will be aboard the Lawrence Gould ship this coming year. Wow, things are we people out here. But it's uh, hopefully people are going to start getting back into the field like that and. With the COVID protocol, we we'll continue to collect data and, and uh, move forward. But thanks again, Oscar, and thank you for allowing me to record it. I'll stop the recording now, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, everyone.